So I am pleased to introduce our next session, which features the culmination of this work. So the Masters in Data Science Student Capstone Presentations. So every MSDS student must complete a capstone project throughout the MSDS program, working on teams with various project sponsors from industry, government, academia, to improve or solve a problem with data science. Our moderator, Raf Alvarado, is quite familiar with these projects, having served as the mentor for many of them. And he is a self-proclaimed digital humanist. I love that. And is the program director and assistant professor for the School of Data Science. So today's presentation is gonna span a wide range of really important and relevant topics to our, our year in 2020. So from COVID-19 and election forecasting to presidential speeches and measuring infrastructure damage with satellite imagery. Please join me in welcoming Professor Raf Alvarado and our capstone presenters. Thanks, Kat. It's my pleasure to introduce these capstones today. We have five and I'll just get right into it. Uh, the first one, uh, the title of the talk or the presentation is COVID-19 from Molecules to Populations, Identifying Potential Therapeutics Through Structure-Based Interactomes and Patient Health Outcomes. And our speakers are uh, Brooke, Brooke Williams, Corey Yemen, and Kevin Lennon. I'll, and you all take it away. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we've given our our capstone, sort of a generic name for today, which is just COVID-19 capstone. We initially uh, were sort of looking at um, looking at mining some patient health data and looking at how uh, how the different uh, drug ability of and molecular structure of different FDA approved drugs uh, can affect, you know, both negatively or positively some patient health outcomes. Um, getting access to the patient health uh, data in the volume that we needed. Uh, just was a little bit more difficult than we expected. So today, for the purposes of this presentation, we're talking about uh, sort of the spread of COVID-19 uh, through an agent-based model um, and how vaccination, which is a sort of uh, current popular topic, um, even as of this week, um, and how vaccination and different strategies there could affect the spread and you know how we could use uh, an agent-based model to look at that and analyze that. Uh, so we can, uh, as we go to the next slide, sort of talk a little bit about the background, uh, which we already mentioned. I don't think COVID-19 needs a ton of background information. Uh, we sort of get that from all directions these days, but we have taken, tried to take into account a lot of the different sort of nuances of this virus, uh, some which have to do with antibodies. Uh, we know that um, sort of the current research says that antibodies don't necessarily last forever in all cases. And uh, we've sort of taken into account them lasting for around three to four months, uh, which is which is what the, you know, the current research is saying. Um, and we've also heard uh, as recently as this week um, about a vaccine that could be up to 90% effective with two doses. And that is something that, um, that Pfizer has put out in its press releases. So we really thought it would be interesting to look at um, how maybe uh, some different vaccination strategies, maybe look at uh, some spread data in the different, um, in just the U.S. and the states, and see how uh, that could be, um, how that could sort of play out over the next uh, sort of year that we're looking at coming, coming up. So a common type of model in epidemiology uh, is called a SIR model. Um, SIR just stands for these states that are listed here. Uh, so they're susceptible, infectious, and recovered or removed. Um, we also have added a state that is um, called D, which is just dead or deceased um, for, for the cases of, of COVID when death is obviously something that is affecting um, COVID and is a huge outcome. Um, and so that really affects your model because once, um, once an individual is dead, they can't um, any longer interact with the environment and the model that we're working with. Um, so we we have taken that into account. Um, and the last uh, sort of additional piece of background for this project is has to do with agent-based models. Uh, agent-based models sort of often are used a lot of times in business problems, um, but agent-based models uh, are sort of involve different uh, agents that make decisions uh, for uh, for their group based on their system and their rules. So often you'll hear, uh, businesses um, and business problems describe an agent that 
uh, sort of takes care of um, volume or one that take, each takes care of sort of a different um, a micro issue within the larger system. Uh, so that is, that's uh, what we've done here is apply that sort of thinking, the agent-based model thinking to uh, co the COVID-19 problem um, using sort of a modified SIR uh, model. And that is, that's what we'll describe now. And I think Kevin will take it away on the next slide. Thanks, Brooke. So we built in another uh, few custom factors we thought would make the model a bit more realistic, a bit more uh, relative to COVID as opposed to more generic uh, uh, pandemic modeling. So the first of which was the transmission rate actually fluctuates. So traditionally it's a constant rate when someone comes into contact with an infect uh, infectious person, they're likely to transmit at a value of P. But we don't think that's actually uh, accurate for this case, given that uh, when there are few cases, businesses tend to open up, you end up social distancing, uh, dis distancing a bit less. People are less uh, great about wearing masks. Uh, when there are few cases, people just really don't behave the same way as when, uh, say, in New York City, when it was fully locked down. Everyone wears a mask. People uh, don't get close to each other in public, rarely have larger events than a couple people. So we think the actual likelihood of transmitting is not meant to be constant. So instead what we do is have it be relative to the current amount of cases uh, adjusted for the size of the population for each state. And there, when uh, there are few cases the likelihood rises and when there are more cases, it goes down as things start to lock down and everything, which really keeps the modeling in check and doesn't allow the disease to either die out immediately or really spike off and uh, have half the population affected within a few weeks. Uh, so that was the first one we did. Then we also added in a vaccine. Um, so we added in the vaccine based on Pfizer and Moderna, since Moderna is likely to have similar results to Pfizer, um, distributed at roughly 4% of the population remaining susceptible population per day, which we arrived at that figure due to uh, the supply of the vaccine based on what Pfizer's announced publicly for the end of the year. And then assuming that Irma would have equal amounts and uh, similar deployment schedules given that they're such similar vaccines. And we assumed that uh, not everyone would end up getting it over this time period, due in part to large skepticism about the vaccine. Uh, I believe about 13% of people uh, see it as high risk to take this vaccine. So we think it's unlikely that uh, segment will really end up getting it. So immun immunizing the entire population isn't quite realistic at uh, the first uh, time period we run it over. And then we uh, decided that the immunity isn't going to be permanent. This isn't uh, you get the disease once or get uh, the vaccine once and then for the rest of your life immune, you're immune. So we decided to have it last around one year for the protective immunity. Uh, and we also added in large ranges. So some people may only be immune for half a year. Some people may be immune for a year and a half uh, to make it a bit more realistic since it's not like everyone has the same immune uh, response. And then all our initial uh, levels of population of case counts of deaths and everything to sort of start the run from here going forward come from the Johns Hopkins data set. And we adjusted this a bit for unconfirmed cases, given uh, especially early in the pandemic, there are a lot of people that had COVID uh, and would later test positive with antibody tests, uh, but could not receive a initial test just due to the lack of limitation. So we did adjust their numbers a bit based on what uh, estimations we'd heard were the true counts. And if you go to the next slide, we can see, uh, so here's an example of Virginia. This is with a vaccine. Uh, all these units are in thousands. So initially there are about 3000 deaths uh, and over the next 200 days, we think that'll balloon up to 8,000 uh, cases, uh, 200,000 up to about a million. These are all rounded a bit. Um, but as you can see, the uh, susceptible part of the population starts to decline pretty rapidly with the vaccine and also with the levels of disease you see actually just moving through the population. And the infected is showing how many people are currently infected at any given point. So we can move on to the next one and see how we would fare without a vaccine. 
So you see over the course, uh, there's about 3,000 additional deaths over these uh, 200 days. And well, 3,000 deaths difference between with and without a vaccine is a lot. We actually expect the bigger impacts to be further outside of that 200 days. Since you see in the other one, most of the population was uh, no longer susceptible. We were actually approaching herd immunity through vac uh, vaccination at that point. But here we're actually going to pretty uh, quickly continue to that same trend of uh, losing a certain amount of people per day. Um, so while it is uh, impactful in the first 200 days, the larger impacts come later, but those are also much more difficult to model. Things get much more uncertain down the road. So we chose to cut it off here where we still had a reasonable degree of accuracy. And on the next slide, you can see the impacts for South Dakota and the start uh, and final values for it. A bit shakier since South Dakota has a smaller population. Uh, yeah, Ralph, if you uh, have something good. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just one wondering if uh, uh, we're, we're keeping to the particular time values here or whether uh, you should just finish. Oh, uh, yeah, we can uh, hurry up then. So um, uh, if you go to the next one, we'll see South Dakota without a vaccine. And then the next slide, we can see uh, the overall results. So uh, there really is a big difference between uh, the with a vaccine and without a vaccine. Uh, in terms of the susceptible population going forward. And herd immunity can be achieved within a bit after 200 days uh, to the point where the, vex or where the virus is mostly under control. And then I'll toss it over to my partners on the next slide. All right, so I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, quickly, the conclusions are somewhat different for South Dakota and Virginia, which is somewhat fascinating given that uh, they're in very different places with South Dakota having a much higher kind of uh, infection rate at their overall population having been infected at this point. Um, yet even even assuming kind of a similar transmission of the vaccine um, or I'm sorry, uh, introduction of the vaccine, um, you still see about a, a one third drop in morbidity with with deaths and, and between 40 and 60 percent um, reduction in the overall caseload in, in the 200 day window. Um, and, and just uh, it is, it's kind of noted elsewhere, um, the uncertainty uh, after about 200 days starts to grow and, and, you know, kind of alters the model conclusions a little bit. Um, all right. And if we go to the next slide, we can speak to the next steps, um, which are how to, how to make this a little better. Um, you know, first, you can deploy this to to kind of help target rollout for, for vaccines, um, I mean, where they're, they're likely to be most efficacious. Um, and in order to do that, there are a couple things, or there are a few things that, that we would suggest doing, which is kind of incorporating um, different agents on, on, you know, mask wearing propensity, um, getting down to a lower level of granularity, uh, to take into account greater density, um, and, and then uh, moving forward and pushing into kind of an RNN sequence type, type model to, to kind of compare, compare results and predictions. Uh, and if you move on to the next slide, we have our references. Um, and then finally, we'll move to the last slide for Q&A. Excellent. Uh, that was really good. I'm very impressed with that. Um, uh, I've got time for one quick question. I, I think I'll ask a question. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but did you all incorporate the K factor in, in your model? Do you know what I'm talking about? the the, the uh, factor that sort of influences the lumpiness or the fact that some it, you know it spreads unevenly uh it's just not as homogenous to say the as the um, spanish flu was yeah so actually our model doesn't uh strictly use an r not the r uh, r not is actually uh derived from uh since it's agent based the agents actually move around somewhat mm -hmm. randomly and oh, cool. end up in certain proximity to each other so we don't actually have a uh, specific um, movement scores for each person or each uh, agent, but because of that, uh, certain ones end up in higher likelihood to be in proximity with other ones. And then through that, they have their certain transmission probability uh, with um, that. So it ends up indirectly being there, but that's actually not how the um, SIR agent-based model is actually parameterized. Oh, cool. So it's, it's almost empirical what you're developing. All right, that's great. I really appreciate that. Uh, let's move on to our next uh, uh, a group. Um, this one uh, is on a different but equally relevant topic. This is the U.S. presidential election forecasting. 
uh, with Ben Rogers, Spencer uh, Mar Marusco, Chad Sapota, and Matt Thomas. Okay, thank you, Dr. Alvarado. Uh, well, as many of you are aware, there was a recent presidential election and for our capstone project, we felt this presented an opportune moment to examine existing presidential forecast models and ultimately develop our own novel model, the Chase the White House model, a Bayesian approach to predicting a presidential election. So if we can go to the next slide. In the first phase of our capstone project, we replicated the code of several of the leading forecasting models to gain a better sense of their methodologies. Although there is some blending of lines, they can be approximately classified by the type of data they use to generate their predictions. Fundamental models generally look at economic factors, demographic data, and election conditions to form a prediction often well in advance of the election. Whereas sediment-based models are built upon text analysis of social media and polling models rely heavily on state and national polling data to generate a prediction often much closer to the actual election day. Upon the completion of our review, we determined the most advantageous model structure would be to leverage a fundamentals-based model with a polling model. Although we are not the first modelers to adopt this approach, we do feel we separate ourselves from other forecasters by collecting and developing state priors from state and national fundamental data, as opposed to only a national prior based on nationwide fundamentals. If we can go to the uh, next slide. The next step was the data collection phase. Given we were collecting economic and demographic data at the state level, we were a bit limited by availability and therefore were only able to capture the state by state data for the past seven elections from 92 through 2016. The data was collected from several government agencies, two social research survey organizations, and we ultimately compiled 57 different state level predictor variables. Um, we ended up with a number of observations at 357. This is due to there being 50 states plus DC over the seven election cycles. So it's a relatively small end still. All right, to slide three, the next slide. Using random forest and lasso regression, we determined a feature set of eight maximized our predictive ability to determine a democratic or Republican state win for each state. Two of these features were engineered in order to capture the changing trends in states due to shifts in the composition of party coalitions. The remaining six features, as you see listed here below, came directly from our data set. Okay, next slide. All right, I will now hand it over to Matt to discuss the development of our fundamental model. Okay, um, so the fundamental model, which Chad mentioned, that's basically the non-polling model that we did. Um, so it was implemented in uh, Python using PyMC3 because it's a probabilistic model. And so the final model, uh, we used a hierarchical model. And um, the reason that we did this was because we wanted to be able to capture both national and state level effects in the same model because we needed a prediction state by state. A lot of the fundamentals models that we looked at uh, only give a national prediction. And so but we wanted one for each individual state. And so this allowed us to have a model in which we could have a predictor, for example, that only applied on the national level. So an example might be uh, presidential approval rating. And then we also uh, could use a state level predictor. So for example, per capita income state by state. And uh, this type of model captures those effects really well. And uh, you know, Chad mentioned the sort of predictors that we use uh, after we whittled them down. And the model turned out to be pretty good even without using polling, uh, probably actually, especially because we did, it didn't use polling. Uh, we only missed two states, Georgia and Florida, and the, those probabilities were pretty close to 50%. The final model, we ended up with a 90% polling model uh, and 10% of the fundamentals. Uh, if you ran the model on election day, and the further back in time you went, the more the fundamentals weighed. Um, can you go to the next slide? And so this shows, this is uh, sort of a, a shot of, of the predictions of some of the states of the fundamentals model. You can see Georgia is right there on the line. Um, Florida is pretty close. Arizona was about exactly correct. And so it performed pretty well. And so in the future, uh, we expect maybe these fundamentals models might have some more, some more influence. And uh, if you go to the next slide, Spencer can talk about the polling model. All right, thanks, Matt. Uh, the other component of our proprietary model was a polling-based model. 
Uh, for our polling model, we started by pulling historical data by state for each of the last three presidential election cycles. This data served as our model starting point. To get polling data, we turned to Nate Silver's website, 538, which provided access to most or all of the polls conducted for each state. In addition to each state's polling data for swing states, we also factored in polling, polling data for states that had voted similarly in prior elections. As new polls were conducted, we reduced the importance of older polls relative to more recently conducted polls. This would emphasize more recent data relative to older data. Uh, one thing of note, we mentioned above, we included historical voting behavior in our model. We actually chose to make historical voting behavior a key aspect of our polling model, just in case polling errors arose similar to 2016. This actually turned out to be rather prescient as polling only models performed very poorly this election cycle. Uh, next slide. Uh, as you can see, the polling model did not forecast many toss-up states. Uh, the predictions would have looked even more extreme if we didn't factor in historical behavior, as that pulled a lot of states back toward the 50% probability. Uh, the reason for this uh, behavior was polling data consistently favored one candidate or the other across this election cycle, which led to more certainty under our model's framework. Uh, after back-to-back -back national election polling errors in the same direction, there are certainly going to be questions about the validity of this methodology going forward. And with that, I'll hand it off to my colleague, Ben Rogers. Thank you. On the next slide, uh, we will show our final model, our final map. Uh, while we looked at a bunch of different models, uh, we will not be talking about all of them. If you would like to see all the models we looked at, please go to our website, chasethewhitehouse.com. Again, chasethewhitehouse.com to look at all of our different models. And on our next slide, we're gonna talk about four models that we really compared ourselves to. Those are Larry Sabato's Crystal Ball, 538, The Economist, and Princeton Election Consortium. So all these models use polls in some sense. And so you can see that we all did pretty well as far as states correct. Uh, some of these are out of 56. That is because you have the 50 states plus District of Columbia, plus the five congressional districts with electoral college votes. We did not include those districts. We only looked at the 50 states and DC, like The Economist. Uh, but you can really see the polling error when you look at the state classification error and the predicted vote margin. So state classification error, this is what when you look at an electoral college map, if it's safe D or likely D, how far is that off from the actual results? Uh, all of this, full disclaimer, this is with current results. These may change. Not all states are certified yet. And on our next slide, we would just like to thank Professor Kropko for all of his help, and we'll pass it over to Professor Alvarado. Yeah, again, very, very impressive and very apropos. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, uh, in the interest of time, let's move on to our next group. Uh, here, we're going to focus on a, a, a different subject area. We're going to talk about measuring infrastructure damage with satellite imagery. And our presenters will be Jordan Bales and Will Carruthers. All right, thanks, Professor Alvarado. Uh, Jordan and I worked on uh, building damage assessment from satellite imagery. We go to the next slide. So our problem started with uh, a nonprofit called Save the Children, and they were tasked with um, trying to see how they could better predict uh, human displacement. And they had a lot of ideas regarding infrastructure damage uh, because that's been a key predictor of human displacement is um, infrastructure gets damaged in a country, people start to either be displaced because of the damage or uh, move uh, because of conflict. And they wanted to see how they might be able to use satellite imagery to predict this. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, in Syria, you can see here that um, from the two images, uh, one was taken in July 2018 and the other May 2019. Uh, this town uh, is uh, over 30% of the buildings were damaged in the entire city. And you can see from this image that it's uh, pretty clear to the human eye that uh, there's been a lot of damage. And that led to over a million citizens fleeing in 2019. Here at the next slide. So in our analysis, we were trying to look for how um, what 
existing models were out there and what existing data sets were out there uh, to predict uh, building damage from a satellite image. And we found this uh, really cool challenge that uh, Carnegie Mellon and the Department of Defense put on. Um, it's called XVT. And they had already taken images from 19 natural disasters around the world and had labeled the data with by experts for uh, each building in the image and an assessment of the damage. And you can see um, this was natural disasters, not a war conflict, but we thought um, there could be some transfer learning there. And it also comes from uh, not just the United States, but all over the world and different types of disasters, um, earthquakes, floods, uh, fire, uh, wind and volcanoes. And so if you could get the next slide. So what our what the model uh, for the XV challenge was is you were given a pre and post image and you're supposed to predict a damage score for each building detected. So you also had to classify um, pixels that were not a building and then for the pixels that were a building, either no damage, minor damage, major damage, or destroyed. And on the, now I'll start talking about the model itself on the next slide. So this shows the uh, input, the image to the left is the pre-image and the image to the right is the post-image. So we really had two tasks, one to uh, figure out which pixels in the images represent a building versus, um, you know, trees, grass, roads, etc. And then for the uh, buildings themselves, uh, what type of damage classification they should have. So for the building detection on the next slide, we leveraged a SpaceNet model, which was another competition that used satellite imagery to uh, just um, tackle the first uh, problem, which is to detect buildings. Um, so we used an existing one uh, we found on uh, GitHub. Uh, we're able to load their own pre-trained weights and apply it to this new data set. And you can see here we've plotted uh, what our model defined as buildings and the uh, bluish purple pixels. And so it does uh, pretty well um, given this uh, data set. And now Jordan will talk more about our model and future work. All right. So as you can see um, on the next slide, as you can see, we use a convolutional neural net built on top of ResNet 50 with the image net weights. This is what enabled the extraction of each of the polygons you saw on the previous slide. Um, next slide, please. After running those individual polygons through the damage classifier, we end up with an output like this. As you can see, the damage score mentioned by Will earlier is color coded with green being no damage and red being completely destroyed. Next slide, please. Finally, we decided to create an interactive web application from our scripts in order to increase accessibility. Um, the application allows users to upload their own images from a tool of their choosing. And finally, we do have a planned feature enhancement to integrate ArcGIS by utilizing our bridge and ArcPy. Um, final slide, please. So how did we improve upon things? First off, we increased computational efficiency. We created the web app to broaden the number of individuals this tool can benefit which of course allows the model to be applied to new problems such as what is occurring in Syria. Um, with that being said, I'll invite Raf back for some questions. Yeah, this is fascinating. I really like the fact that you uh, close the arc and have a, a data product that's available online. So my first question is, uh, is do you have the URL for that? Is that something available? I, I actually know some particular people who'd be interested in that. We don't have it hosted yet. We needed something more custom than what was um, like out there right now, but it is in the works and we will have one soon. Okay. Also, I wanted to ask, uh, so you said you did use transfer learning, is that correct? Or? We did. 
Yeah, and I just wanted to point out that what's interesting here is you use ResNet as your first set of layers, and, and ResNet was is is a is a is trained on all kinds of things like faces and 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 uh, photographs, and you're using these and, and you're applying it to uh, be the first layers of a network involving com a completely different kind of imagery, and the fact that it works, I think, is really quite interesting. Uh, you know, is there something you can say about that? Why it would work, even though it's trained on a completely different kind of data? Yeah, I can start. Um, we used the weights from, or the model used the weights from uh, ImageNet, which mm -hmm. does contain, um, it's one of the biggest crowdsourced or um, uh, image data sets out there. Right. Um, but since we built, since the model had layers on top, um, it basically allows you to use transfer learning to learn different things. So the image net weights are used um, for like the first uh, 50 layers. And then we have like five or seven layers on top of uh, those 50, which really dig down to the, you know, actual damage classification. Yeah. And yeah, I think it speaks really well to the effectiveness of that approach, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's great. Um, I don't see another question uh, in the, in the uh, poll everywhere. So um, I, I think that's a wonder, that's a great talk. Again, it would be nice to see it when you, whenever it's ready, uh, the URL uh, and share that. I think it's excellent. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next group. Uh, this time we're going back to uh, COVID. Uh, this is a, uh, the topic is using Twitter to understand public attitudes toward COVID. And our presenters are Jai Hyun Lee, Cullen Baker, Jason Nguyen. Uh, yeah, and those are the, our, our three speakers for, for this uh, particular presentation. Uh, hey everyone. Um, so our project is on understanding public attitudes toward COVID with Twitter. Um, I'm Jason, and I'll be handing it off to Jay around halfway. Um, next slide. So framing the problem, um, we really wanted to understand public perception towards COVID. Um, some questions we had in mind are, what do people think about COVID? Um, how have their feelings or sentiments changed over time and why? And we wondered if we could predict future events based on historical trends. Next slide. Um, so framing the problem, how can we answer these questions? Um, we decided to use Twitter. Um, Twitter is a social media platform where people can share their opinions and thoughts. And uh, it was very useful to us because there are a large volume of users. And so we thought it would be a good place for us to explore. Um, we also considered using things like articles uh, and stuff like that. But just because Twitter is a platform where anyone can share their opinions, um, we thought it was most relevant to represent the masses of people um, next slide. Data pipeline. So uh, the Twitter search API um, allows us to attain tweets related to COVID. Um, so basically, whenever a tweet is made um, related to COVID, um, we're going to be able to extract it by searching for terms such as hashtag Corona, COVID, quarantine, um, stay at home, stuff like that. So any sort of tweet that contains any of those hashtags or keywords, we're going to extract them. Um, we also store various tweet metadata. Next slide. Um, so these are the tools we use. Um, so we created a Docker con to container to store MySQL database. Um, the database is where we're going to store all of our tweets and the different data. Um, to schedule the jobs um, for the daily Twitter scraping, we're using Ravana, which is UVA's high performance computing system. Um, we use it to basically schedule a job every day to obtain all tweets that were made in the previous day related to COVID. Um, we, and we insert those into our database. And we also use Ravana for conducting different analysis. Next slide. Um, the data. So the data we, cont or we stored are contained at both the tweet level and the account level. Um, so for instance, related to the tweet, we have all the text. Um, we have like the tweet ID. We also have info at the account level. So we'll have like the number of followers and friends and stuff like that. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then after we sort all these tweets, we also did um, traditional 
natural language processing. Um, so we had to make all tweets lowercase. We filter out non-English uh, words. We also had to remove unwanted characters. So things like hyperlinks um, and emojis and stuff like that wouldn't be useful to us. Uh, so we removed that. Um, we also removed stop words, which are you know traditional English words. And then we took the tokens and stems um, of these. Next slide. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Jay now. Thanks, Jason. Um, so we started analyzing the tweets by clustering them into five topics that best characterize them. Each circle here um, is a group of similar tweets based on their word choice. The size of the circles represents how many tweets are included in the topic, and the distance between the circles represents how similar those topics are to each other. In other words, the closer the two circles are with each other, the more similar the topics are to each other. Here I'll be looking at topic one and three in more detail. Next slide. In topic one, highlighted in red on the left, we could observe that these tweets are concerned with health issues and safety measures. The top three tokens are wash your hands, stay home, and wear a mask, followed by please. The list continues to include social distancing, quarantine, protect family, and mental, suggesting that people are not only concerned with their physical, but also mental health as the pandemic continues to surge globally. Topic three, on the other hand, is associated more directly with COVID-19 itself and its record high, rapidly rising cases and the latest news on vaccines. Some of the top terms are vaccine, death, Pfizer, and record breaking million. Next slide. Um, here I'm comparing the number of tweets and the number of new cases created daily. The bars represent the number of tweets and the line represents the number, the number of new cases. The trend seems to be that each time we observe a record high daily kind of new cases, there's an explosive spike in the number of tweets the following day. For example, on October 24th, we hit a local maximum and the next day on 25th, we can see almost 10 times more tweets than the past day. This trend is also spotted on October 30th and 31st, which is Halloween and November 7th and 8th. Next slide. Um, so this led me to study how the public sentiment evolved over time, again, during the last four weeks. Uh, in a scale from negative one to one, one connotes positive sentiments in the tweets, and negative one means negative sentiments, with zero being neutral. For the most of the time, tweets were very close to being neutral, uh, neither positive nor negative. There is a hint of a positive trend in the last few days which I would attribute again to the major announcement from Pfizer on their effectiveness of the vaccine. Um, so on October 21st, we observed a huge upward jump with thousands of positive tweets coming from the public. The top salient terms on this day are shown on the upper left corner, which include science, medical, vaccine, and this was when Pfizer announced uh, their full analysis of its phase three studies at ID Week 2020, which is a joint annual meeting for health professionals on infectious diseases. So there was a good news on this day. However, a week after on 28th, we see a sharp decline in the chart on this day, Pfizer delivered their third quarter earnings report along uh, with the announcement that its vaccine results will not be ready by end of the month, um, which disappointed many people since President Trump has long been predicting that the vaccine would be available before the election day. Um, also on the same day, France announced uh, new lockdown restrictions due to the rising cases in Europe. Next slide. Um, this slide shows an attempt to capture overall context with a word embedding in hopes of discovering any kind of hidden trend that we are not aware of yet. Here, word tokens are nicely clustered together in a 3D vector space similar to what we saw with different topics earlier. On the upper right corner, you can see that I searched one of the terms we saw in the top keywords in topic one, which is, uh, which is a wear a mask. And I found other word tokens that have similar representation, which are highlighted in color, in three vector space. Uh, darker colors represent more similarity to my search term. On the right side is a entire list of those words um, that are similar to my search term are social distance, mask up, and keep your distance in this case. Next slide. Um, I searched Halloween here and 
with which I expected to see more tokens related to precautions and safety protocols like stay home. But unfortunately, the top terms here were fun, happy, celebrate, and enjoy. There was only one point that stood out here, uh, which I think shows um, uh, a frustration from those who are concerned that many people are not being more careful in times like this, which is uh, on the bottom of the list, wear a damn mask. Next slide. Um, so while many people on Twitter seem to be emphasizing the importance of taking safety protocols and caring about their physical and mental health, it also seems that many others become a little too optimistic from time to time, especially during holidays or celebrations. This could be and it should be a major concern for all of us as the nation's biggest holiday is fast approaching in a few weeks. And during the past four weeks, um, the major issue around COVID-19 was Pfizer and its vaccine as the number of cases started to surge again. And the public's emotions uh, seem to be swaying almost exclusively on how effective a vaccine is and when it will become available. And that will be the end of our presentation. And back to you, Rob. Excellent, that's really fascinating stuff. Uh... I, did, I just have a quick methodological question. I'm, I don't know if you mentioned it, but you're, you, you're using topics. So I assume you're talking about topic models and you did you use LDA? Yes, we use uh, Jensen and Jensen. functions and dictionaries to build LDA model. Okay, so I've heard uh, one of the uh, uh, problems of applying LDA to Twitter is that uh, the bag, if you will, the, the unit of discourse is too small sometimes. Uh, it doesn't seem like you had that problem. Did you aggregate your, your tweets into larger chunks uh, or did you just not find that to be a problem? Um, so we did have some problems with pre-processing the tweets first to feed it into our LDA model. Mm -hmm. um, so the output, um, the resulting model we have is not as clean as we'd like to have. Um, yeah, so we tried um, a different methods of pre-processing, um, as you mentioned, uh, very short sentences of tweets in this case. So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, aggregation would be uh, another method to improve that. Yeah, it's, but I, as I was saying, I think I think it turned out well. It looks like you have uh, intelligible and, and meaningful results. Anyway, uh, that's great, uh, gr great stuff. Uh, let's move on to our final, our final group at this point. Uh, we're going back to the presidency as a topic. Uh, our final presenters are going to talk about presidential speeches and uh, they are Kevin Finity, Ramit Garg and Maxwell McGaw. Hi, thanks Professor Alvarado. <clears throat> Hi everyone, my name is Ramit Garg and my teammates Kevin Finity and Max McGaw will be speaking this afternoon on our work associated with text anal uh, analysts on uh, candidate speeches for the 2020 presidential election. Now, even though there's still some contention on the election results, um, we're fortunate enough to speak to you on the topic after election day to reflect on how receptive voters may have been with regards to some of the candidate viewpoints on the issues within their speeches. Next slide. So looking at our motivation here with the analysis, we really wanted to explore if there's any trends that we could identify with topics of interest, <clears throat> the tone and sentiment of speech delivery, um, the type of vocabulary used to get the messaging out to voters, um, how the uh, candidates did with representation of ideological values. Um, we also wanted to figure out if these speeches were a good representation for actual election results uh, where there would be voter alignment on what the candidates focused on and how important it was for them. Next slide. So while we were thinking through different potential analyses, we were also thinking through where we could source our data from. Um, when we started exploring this project back in uh, earlier in the summer, we could not find any hand-coded transcripts um, that were made on a consistent basis, which would have been a lot easier. Um, so what we came up with, I think a pretty innovative solution which was to run a daily automated pipeline. Um, and what this pipeline would do would search for election speeches using YouTube's API. Um, when it found matches for speeches made that day, it would record the auto-generated captions for that speech um, and then store them in a JSON. 
Um, this obviously isn't perfect. You can see on the right hand side, the kind of data that we're working with. Um, it's exactly as it would appear in a video. So you have um, a text start, the duration, and then what that text actually is. Um, so there's no formatting into paragraphs. There's no punctuation, nothing like that. But um, since most of our analysis was done using bag of words models, we could just take all these chunks of text, lump them all together to create one big speech. Um, and this worked out pretty well. And um, the data, with, which includes all the speech data, as well as metadata, such as video IDs, view counts, things like that, that's all stored. Um, and we can pass the link later on. Next slide, please. OK, great. So now we actually have data to work with. So what's next? Uh, first, we actually looked at text analy uh, analysis uh, and basically looking at how candidates exuded specific emotions in their delivery uh, in hope of communicating their messages. Uh, there are several examples of this uh, throughout, throughout our uh, corpus, but uh, we've really shown two notable examples here. Uh, the first is the output of Harris's uh, response to the Supreme Court nomination of uh, Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, you can see the emotional response was really directed towards anger, fear, and anticipation on the news, and that Harris was really trying to uh, convey this to the voters. You know, and uh, on the other hand, the second speech shown is from uh, Trump's Independence Day message at Mount Rushmore. Now you can see the level of joy communicated here, uh, you know, reflecting you know the tone and, and demeanor of the speech that he's uh, you know attempting to communicate. Uh, now, oh, one, one item that you'll notice is you'll see that both speeches and many more if you go through the exercise on our website that we'll get to later, um, is that we have trust as the top emotion. And that's because the emotion lexicon that we used recognizes the terms president and united as linked to trust. So we're going to see the commonality you know, throughout the videos. Uh, now, let's look at some additional elements uh, of our analysis. Next slide. So our early analysis focused on word frequencies. Here you can see the most common trigrams or three word phrases for each speaker. You'll notice that we removed very common words known as stop words. So president of the United States turns into president United States, helps to compress the meaning. These trigrams are interesting because they reveal a speaker's catchphrases like build back better or make America great again. And also their major talking points like the Affordable Care Act, late term abortion or the New York Times. Next slide. So I don't want to get too deep into the technical details here, but here we're looking at one way to cluster the speeches or to show how similar they are to each other. In the upper right, you can see the purple pence speeches, very distinctive. They have a consistent style, reusing the same words and phrases. Compared to the Biden and Harris along the bottom, who tend to use a wider range of vocabulary. The Trump speeches tell a different story, which you can explore in more detail using our interactive web app. But the tight cluster on the left are his rallies. The ones a little further out are his interviews. And the ones mixed in with Biden are his major public appearances, State of the Union, Mount Rushmore, and Fourth of July, speeches with a more presidential tone. Next slide. So another analysis we did was topic modeling using an algorithm called Leighton Dirichlet Allocation, or LDA. Um, the core of what this algorithm does is you pass a corpus of text through and it can pull out um, major themes from the text. So the visual we're showing shows the top 10 topics for Biden. Um, the size of the bubble just represents the amount of time that Joe Biden spent talking about that particular topic. Um, and then you can see the more distant, the topics that were similar, or more clustered together. Um, and on the right side, you see the words that are most representative of that topic. So um, this is all interactive on, in our web app, but for our purposes, we've highlighted topic number six, which is one of the more distinct um, topics. And you can see that this has a clear like climate, energy, industry focus with um, keywords such as climate, jobs, energy, air, vehicles, things of that nature. Um, and what we noticed that was interesting when we compared these to um, the vice presidential candidates, so Kamala Harris and Mike Pence, um, was that while Joe Biden's topics are obviously very distinct, he has topics for the Supreme Court nomination for the economy, for healthcare and the COVID-19 pan pandemic, um, both Kamala Harris and Mike Pence spend a lot of their time just talking about their respective candidates. Um, so instead of a lot of interspersed bubbles, we would typically see one or two very large bubbles clustered close together and then a bunch of very small bubbles indicating that um, their topics were not um, very distinct at all. They tended to focus on one or two key topics. Uh, we can go to the next slide. 
And then for comparison's sake, um, this is the topic modeling that we did for Donald Trump's speeches. Um, you can see these are also pretty close, uh, clustered pretty closely together. Although we did pull out the one topic that was far and away distinct from the others. And you can see it's a very Trumpian topic with words like men, freedom, heritage, statues, um, things of that nature. So definitely very Trumpian speeches. Um, the topics on the left here that are all very similar um, are a lot harder to distinguish when you look at the keywords. Um, lots of generic terms about the economy and jobs and China and elections, um, which is still can provide insight into the things that Trump is talking about. We can go to the next slide. And so what's interesting about this topic modeling is we can see how these candidates are playing to their bases. So for Trump voters, you can see an exit polling from the New York Times on the right. Um, for the Trump voters, they were very concerned about the economy and crime and safety as top issues. And we can see that in what Donald Trump's main topics are focused on. Um, voters for Joe Biden, on the other hand, really were focused on the coronavirus pandemic and racial inequality. Um, and so you can see Joe Biden speaking more to those topics to try to win over those voters. Um, what is also interesting, though, is that for the overall voter pool, the number one topic of most importance was the economy. And um, even despite um, Joe Biden having this dispersed array of topics, his number one topic still was an economic topic. We can go to the next slide. So to be honest, we've had quite a few interesting ideas that we haven't really had the time to fully explore. This data has a lot of potential and the pipeline could also be reused for other text analytics projects. If you want to try any of these ideas for yourself, we're still working on it, but the code and data are available on our GitHub. Next slide. So this concludes the presentation of our analysis. Uh, as we stated before, we've created a web app that you can go to and explore our work in more detail. The link is available on the page. Um, we've, uh, we've embedded uh, videos of speeches, uh, have speech transcripts, and all the interactive visualizations that we shared as part of this presentation uh, there. Um, our web app is built on Streamlit with uh, continuous deployment uh, from GitHub to Heroku. Um, we also have the GitHub repository uh, listed there that you can access for the full collection of speeches, uh, JSON data, which is something that's kind of unique. Uh, it's not really available for the 2020 cycle in terms of getting all of this data, as we've mentioned before. So it's, it's a great starting point to use it for your own analysis if you, if you want to later on. Um, with that said, we thank you for your time today and look forward to taking your questions. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, really impressed to see that. Uh... I, I want to point out one thing because basically I think you guys um, summarize very well some of the differences that we all uh, sort of intuitively understand about the differences between these candidates, but it's very precise and very lucid. I think these these uh, methods are very, uh, you know, showed themselves to be not just, you know, not fuzzy. I mean, they're pretty clear. One thing I did notice, though, um, did I see right that the first principal component distinguished not between Biden and Harris and Trump and Pence, but between Trump and Pence? In other words, Trump and Pence have the most divergent speech, and then the next principal comp component distinguishes between the, the Republican and Democrat uh, pairs. Is that is that correct? That's that's true. Yeah, I think some of this uh, effect was because partly that Trump. Uh, and Pence both had the most distinctive types of speeches, so it was easier for the the PCA to uh, separate them. That's um, yeah. that makes sense. I guess I guess one would then need to control for genre or something like that, or content or or type, as you were saying, type of speech. Anyways, that struck me as really interesting, uh, something I wouldn't have expected uh, coming up. But I guess it, it makes sense in retrospect. Uh, we really don't have. Um, let me see. Uh, uh, much more time. I think we're we're right on time here. I wanted to thank everybody. I think these are all really wonderful projects. And I love the fact that so many of them uh, have ended up as uh, usable data products that we can all sort of uh, use and experience downstream. Um, again, thank you all. And I'm going to, to pass it off. Mm -hmm.